I am Amy Vetter, and welcome to the Breaking Beliefs Podcast. This valuable time is for you to pause in your day and go on your own self journey. Discover the beliefs that are holding you back from living your best life at work and at home. Learn from the guests on this show as they share their inspirational stories on how they found ways to break internal beliefs that were no longer serving them. Because if you believe you can, you will. And our podcast begins now. Welcome to this episode of Breaking Beliefs. And I'm also excited to say this is our 50th episode of Breaking Beliefs. And I just feel it's a milestone uh, coming from the beginning of when the thought came to be about putting this episode out there and all of the comments and feedback that you have given me has motivated me to keep going with this. I have interviewed so many fascinating leaders from all different professions. So hopefully these episodes are helping you from a personal standpoint, really dig deep and understand where your belief systems are coming from and are they serving you and helping you in your work life or personal life. But I would also say uh, that hopefully you share these episodes with friends, colleagues, family members that could use the inspiration as well and subscribe so that we can keep growing this podcast too because there's so many great nuggets of advice from these leaders from all over. And this episode is no different. I have so many notes with my interview from Paul Peterson. He is the managing partner at WIS. He leads the firm's long-term strategy and helps cultivate the environment where their people can flourish in servicing their clients. He's been inspired by the spirit of entrepreneurship and the close relationships that form with servicing privately held companies and family businesses. He has extensive experience providing accounting, auditing, tax services, as well as advising clients on strategy, personnel, and organizational structure. He is a graduate of Seton Hall University and earned his MBA from Stern School of Business at NYU. Aside from spending time with his family, Paul enjoys sports and music. In this episode, Paul shares his journey from staff accountant to managing partner and the importance of his value systems that were key to ensuring his career was aligned with his purpose and that his leadership is authentic. Welcome everybody to this episode of Breaking Beliefs. And today I'm with Paul Peterson from WIS. And Paul, do you wanna just start off and give a little background on yourself? Yeah, sure, and thank you for having me today, Amy. I appreciate it. Um, So yeah, I'm Paul Peterson. I am the managing partner uh, for WIS, and WIS is a metropolitan, when we say metropolitan, New Jersey, New York City-based accounting firm, although we've become more of an advisory firm over the past several years. And personally, I have been here at WIS for over 25 years, so um, it's been a nice run. And yeah. I'm still looking for that to, that run to continue. <laughs> well, good. Yeah. So, I, and I can't wait to hear your journey through WIS because I'm sure there's been a lot of pivots and turns along yeah. the way. And you hear very few people that are in their job for their career, same company. So that's, that's cool. Yeah. So I want to start off, though, just getting a little bit of background. Like, where did you grow up? What did your parents do? Sure. That sort of thing. So um, I actually grew up in the, in the town that uh, we actually have our business established here now. <laughs> and there was, I know people think that was by design, but it was not. Um, so I grew up in Florham Park, New Jersey, which is a, um, a suburb within um, northern New Jersey. And it was, uh, when I uh, grew up here, it definitely wasn't anything what it's like uh, today. It was uh, almost rural, quite honestly. Um, And I um, grew up in a household where with my, my dad was an an accountant, but not a public accountant, accountant uh, uh, for private industry. And he was a controller for a company for a number of years. And my mother was a a stay-at-home mom who had to raise uh, one of three boys, which was not easy. (laughs) 
Uh, so my poor mom, uh, we were <laughs> quite active and she disruptive. She kept trying for that girl, and then after the third, she's like, Dude, that was it. it. That, that, that was it. They were done. And, and uh, you know, and, and I was the middle child, so I was probably the toughest. Um, but we learned some pretty valuable lessons along the way. My father uh, happened to be a part of a management buyout um, at a time during my uh, middle school years where the person that they ultimately allowed to be the controlling shareholder um, turned against um, my father and the other minority shareholders and took control of the company and mm. forced all them out. So we, I, I uh, saw uh, at a period of time where it was very difficult for my father even to get a, a job because that was right in the really the earlier part of the 80s where mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the economy wasn't uh, booming yet. Um, and, and to see, you know, the way in which my, my father handled that, it wasn't him and it, it took him a while to find a job. It was, it was a very difficult uh, place to be. And, and, but that changed, I think it had such an impact on, on me um, because I, from that moment forward, I always felt like I'm never going to allow anyone to control my destiny. That was really interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, that was like, and, and from there I, I really did a lot of things, um, on my own, I, I, you know, had a newspaper business, a lawn mowing business, mm -hmm. shovel driveways. I did anything I possibly can to not have to work for anyone. <laughs> 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 uh, but eventually I had to break down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting. I, I had a very similar experience. My mom, but not working for someone, but she owned maid services. And wow. um, they focused in the construction industry when the savings and loans went down. Okay. And she lost her business. Um, same thing though, that I was like, I will never make those mistakes again. And, and you know, like you're watching because your life changed overnight. Yeah, exactly. And we went, uh, you know, it went from a, a comfortable, very secure environment to one in uh, with, we were thinking we had to move and sell the house and, you know, it was, um, it was really um, a stressful time that, that was felt in the household. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, uh, yeah. Very, and how was he during that? It wasn't him. I mean, you know, I'm sure uh, that he was depressed, although there was really, you know, not the connotation back then you didn't use. Um, but yeah, he wasn't himself at all. I mean, yeah. 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 He was withdrawn, I would say, for a period of time. So what would you do to, were you trying to help around the house or help him or what, how did that change your role? Yeah, I think we tried to keep, I mean, which was good with what my, both my parents did is they tried to keep it as normal as possible for us. So that didn't really mm -hmm. impact us, but like trying to shield us from it, but you, but you knew it was impacting them. Right. Right. Um, which I wonder sometimes maybe it would have been better if we just openly had, you know, talked about it. But I, I, I think, yeah, to, I, I think it just made us tougher. I mean, I think mm -hmm. at that point in time, we all sort of just came together as, as a family and, and got by. So if there were things that, you know, we cut out, like uh, it, we cut out, like it would just right. accept it, right? Yeah. So I think it was more like we made those choices than it was like anything, because uh, my, my, my dad loved doing house projects anyway, and, he, and I had an older brother. Um, so I, it freed me up to go do other things. <laughs> <laughs> I was, just, I was playing sports all the time. Yeah, yeah. So what did he end up getting a job doing? Well, thankfully, yeah. And it worked out really well. It's like one of these, you know, real kind of good stories. Um, he ended up taking a, a job, uh, made probably a third of what he was making, um, in, uh, Teaneck, New Jersey, which is a, it's a, about an hour, I would say, with traffic from where uh, we lived or whatever. And, and he ended up being a controller there and had that job for, oh God, he's been there since the mid 80s, I guess. So a long time. Wow. Uh, it worked out. And uh, unfortunately, um, the matriarch of that business, it's a, it's a small family uh, business, um had lived uh an ex i think to 102 oh wow but she outlived her her children and and you know she left the business to my dad so it's like one of these very good good uh, feel good oh stuff. wow yeah 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 so he's um in his late 70s and, and still working 
<laughs> like a typical accountant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, they never give up. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, my brothers uh, are both my brothers are in the business, so they're all together. Oh, okay. Yeah, so your cool. brothers yeah, went to work It's a nice little him. story. Yeah. Yeah. So, and and what's also interesting is your longevity and where you've worked. That yeah. your father was like that as well. You saw that. Yeah, loyal, very loyal. Probably loyal to a fault at times, but yeah, yeah. 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 But sticking it out, right? Through yeah, that's, that's a good business. way to put it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because it's not always pretty. No. Um, definitely not. So, why would you decide to be an accountant after seeing that happen to your dad? That's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things I think. Look, I think. Uh, the fact that he was able to find a job again. And at the time, uh, and, and I was always good at numbers. Mm -hmm. So I looked at it as like, okay, well, good at numbers. And then um, I was influenced once by a guest speaker that came in uh, to college who said, there's no such thing as an unemployed CPA. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what's, that, that definitely stuck. And I was like, all right, well, I never want to be unemployed because of what my dad had to go through. Right. I control my own destiny and go to numbers. Uh, so that sounds like a, a good career choice. And, and at the time, too, coming out, I was coming out late 80s, whatever. There was a lot of jobs like accounting. It was like it, as long as you got a reasonable grade, you were going to get a job. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah. Isn't that interesting how that speaker has no idea just using the word unemployed yeah. was enough for you to that be like, it. that's it. That's yeah. all I'm, I'm, you know, like yeah. you never know who's sitting in an audience and what resonates. <laughs> so, it's so true. Actually, it's really true, you know, and, and I'll never forget it to this day that that conversation, but right. it, it was impactful. And he probably left thinking like, ah, here are these college students that listen to one thing I said. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, I made my career choice uh, based on his talk. Yeah. yeah, that's the impact we have without even realizing it. So true. So, so true. was there something else you dreamed of being? Entrepreneur. No okay. question about it. I love business. I, I love, but you know, again, I, I, I can't help but be competitive, I guess, from sports. Like mm -hmm. I just always enjoy trying. I really didn't care about winning. It was more like the aspect of trying to be the best you can, you know, that, I don't know. I, I still like that. I still am driven by that, you know? Yeah. 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 Which keeps your job interesting. It does. It definitely does. And, and I never want to lose that. I, I feel like that's edge, I think. That, yeah. That you just keep knowing too, that there, you're, there's so much out there to learn. And, uh, but I, I always felt like, um, you know, I still run today. It's like, okay, well, how can I run faster? You know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> getting harder. Um, but you know, that's just, I think that was just kind of in me. And, and um, I felt that like if I could find a place to bring that and control my destiny by being a CPA, cause that's what I always felt like, okay, well then I can always go off on my own. And, and that was always my fallback. And I went into working um, at a firm like WIS with the mindset that I eventually was going to just go out on my own. Mm -hmm. That was, that was always like the plan. Right. You know? um, and then when I started working here and getting, so you started at another firm first. Yeah. I was at a, at a national firm. Yeah. Okay. Doing yeah. audit or tax. Yeah. Doing audit, doing okay. audit. And um, I, I, it was not for me at all. Mm -hmm. And so to be honest, so, so with the way it worked is, I started off that way, left pretty quickly knowing like this, like I, I just was, um, a, I did not like not feeling as though I could develop relationships. That, mm -hmm. That's what it was at that point. To be honest, that was the biggest driver for me it was just, you know, coming in and, um, you know, you don't even have a desk that you're at. I, it's just what, right. you know, um, and so what I said is like, oh, maybe I'll try private. Uh, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe just public's not the answer. And then I went into private and I realized everyone that actually was in a uh, leadership position had worked in public accounting, right? For, for a period of time. So they mm -hmm. had their CPA designation. 
they had that experience and, and they almost were brought in at a managerial or a leadership position directly from the firm into that role. So to move up organically and internally was going to be a challenge. Right. Um, and, and that, and I was like, all right, well, I got to get out of here then. Um, mm -hmm. So that's when I, I, I said, but I needed to be at a firm that was like a, a WIS type, more servicing entrepreneurs or family businesses. And then in an environment that I felt like I can have relationships with my fellow coworkers. Like that really was the number one driver, quite honestly, at the time. Mm -hmm. And that's what brought me to WIS. Now, I'm, and I'll, I had a great interview. Like we all say, we had a guy here at the time was, was a recruiter and he had a way to, to, to connect with people and you left feeling really good about the organization. And I remember even walking around and it had a community feel to it. Like you, you saw, it was weird, really different, the, the vibe that you, yeah. that you got, you know? And, and what kind of position did you come in doing? I came, yeah, I came in as a staff accountant. Um, I had to kind of start from scratch, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, was fine. I had an advantage because when I was in college, I had, a, um, I had started a, um, a cookie business that I did. Yeah, I did. It was what kind of cookies? Yeah, well, we started off with chocolate chip, of course, <laughs> um, but it was Paul and Todd's homemade. And um, yeah, we, we, uh, we did actually pretty well. I did it. I, I actually left that part out of the story, but I did that for a year after school at a college. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that I learned so much. Best thing I ever did by far. I, and it was tough because, you know, I gave up the salary and, um, you know, you'd be with your friends out at the bars or whatever. And, they would be talking about what they're making. And meanwhile, like I'm, I'm not making any money. I'm just right. like pouring money in, you know, <laughs> any dollar we and, make. And were that. you a really good chocolate chip cookie maker? Or so what, where learn. did this? We learned. Yeah, we had to learn. Like, so why, just... why did you choose cookies? Because we went up. I'll tell you what happened. We went. <laughs> um... <laughs> we went on. We went on a winter break in college to Sugarbush, Vermont, and that's close by Ben and Jerry's. And what happened was the week we picked to ski in the middle of January ended up being like 62 degrees, like almost average temp. There was mm -hmm. no skiing. So we spent our time in, uh, you know, uh, around a lot of talking, a lot of beer drinking. And uh, one day we ventured out to do something. So we went to Ben and Jerry's factory and I was with one of my friends like, well, you know, we should just try this with cookies. So we came back and just started doing it. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, like, we had my grandmother's. No, recipe. not at all. In fact, like, the first sheet pan we had was so crooked. Um, <laughs> but you know, it was like a story, though. Like, here's these two dudes that are coming, walking in and, you know, talking to these delis about, like, hey, you want our cookie? And they're like, yeah, well, of course, yeah, put them out. And, we, and they would give us, like, great positioning. You know, it'd be like an impulse buy. And, you so know, isn't good. that interesting? So so were they the best cookies or you had them branded or positioned well? well they were homemade, which helped. Right. So, uh -huh. um, so I would say that they were very good because they're, you know, at a price point, they're homemade. Um, so it was like easy to compete against um, some of those like wrapped up cookies that are, you know, like been on the shelf for God knows how long. Uh, but business model wise was very difficult because you had to make sure they were fresh. Right. You know? There's so, not much scale to it. Yeah. No, and we tried different things. We tried frozen. We tried everything. I mean, we got to the point where we actually were renting space in a factory, which was pretty cool. You know, the best, the, the fest, we would go to festivals and just blow them out. I mean, um, but it was hard to keep the quality up when you're trying to do fresh cookies and delivering, and it's not a good business model. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a reason they're packaged. Exactly. Yeah. hundred percent. Why you use preservatives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So back to WIS. So you start as a staff accountant. Yeah. Doing tax. Uh, audit. Audit. audit? But okay. So you went back to audit. I did. I went back to audit, but the way it was, um, even though you were quote unquote audit, you really touched a lot during those days. Like you didn't have such separation of service areas. There mm -hmm. really wasn't like um, these different departments. I mean, even like our tax department back then were more like just tax experts and you had like a handful of them. 
Mm -hmm. um, so we did a little bit of everything. We would close books, we would do audits, we would do tax returns, we did personal returns. And I'm happy that, that you know, I really did that um, because it gave me such a great understanding of all these different nuances of a business. So, um, you know, it was perfect for me uh, just to kind of learn more about how businesses operate, what's important to the client. Mm -hmm. I realized how important the tax aspect was to the client and how important it is to also know these different elements about how to become an advisor. I, I think my, my, I, I definitely knew right away that I, I'm the most enjoyment I had even during that time was having conversations with either the controller, if I was so lucky uh, to speak to one of the owners just about their business. That, right. That, I was like, Oh, I was always like, well, who, how, how do you get customers? And, what, what is it that you do that makes you different? And, and those times, you know, like I, I cared more about that than I did about any of the putting work papers together or whatever. Right. You know? Yeah. So you found your niche there. Yeah. And it was easy because you got access to it. Right. So like I, you know, I just felt that um, even, you know, at, at a younger age, you get this unbelievable access to, to um, what goes on with, some of the top decision makers at, in the company, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And that was always the divide with audit and advisory, right? Like I, I always felt that audit is actually the perfect background to become an advisor, but when you're an auditor, they don't want to hear your advice because no, <laughs> they're afraid you're going to give them an audit point versus yes. like yeah. you do the same thing as an advisor and they're, they're like soaking it in. That's so true. It really is. Yeah. The, the uh, putting yourself in different context, but you really the skill set like i wouldn't i wouldn't be able to advise if i didn't know auditing right you know or or had been business process and, yeah yeah and just getting all that and understanding you know what how it all kind of comes together so how so what was your track like how do you think you have come into your own now yeah. being the managing partner there like what was your path to that <laughs> Very difficult, um, but yeah, <laughs> I, th I think a couple things. I think that- um, Did you have a goal of being a managing partner? A hundred percent, you know, and I think, yeah. and, I, and I don't want to come across as arrogant about it, but I always- No, like, that's- Yeah, yeah I, always, I just always felt like I could be doing this better and I was kind of young. And, and it wasn't so much just like strategic or anything like that. I just felt as like people, like how to treat people. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was in the firm at a time where there were um, uh, there was a strong divide between the traditional keeping the traditional way, a very um, bureaucratic top down way versus what was happening outside of, let's say, traditional accounting firms in this movement, whether it was casual dress or, you know, this whole movement around more being and bringing your yourself and allowing people to be more human. And I was very fortunate. The, the, the primary reason why I stayed is I was surrounded by people that agreed with the way in which we wanted to treat others mm -hmm. and the way that we, I mean, look, the way that we wanted to be treated and the way we felt others should be treated and to really look at um, coming together. And we did, I, I happened to, you know, be close with, um, you know, several other uh, people that we grew up kind of at the same time in the firm. And we had this a belief that you can run an accounting firm in a way that was more humanistic. And you didn't have to be so divided. Even if you're a partner, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be accessible and, and just as accountable to the culture as any other person within mm -hmm. the firm. We, we really felt that there were certain aspects of the of the WIS culture that were were wonderful, and we were lucky that it was somewhat progressive at the time to even allow us that I think insight to we can do this. Mm -hmm. um, but we had to really overcome a lot of obstacles to to do it. And there were people that were very anti that way. Um, mm -hmm. They looked at there was this concept around, or, or they really it's a belief that if you treat people good, they're going to take advantage of you. That was like, that was, you know, one of the overarching, I would say, themes to 
And, and why did they, why did they think that you think? I, you know, I, I always questioned why, you know, that that's a great uh, question, Amy. Uh, I really believe that it was more around, they wanted to keep people down to, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, there was a kingdom um, at the time at the top levels. And once a kingdom is established, the, the king wants to keep the kingdom going. I mean, right. and um, you know, that, that really, was frustrating and we realized that you know there was going to be a breaking point right so as we were uh but but i'll tell you thankfully we always felt that let's do the right thing like always try to always keep to the right thing even though your uh path and goal is out there do the right thing but at the same time be detached if you're not going to be able to get there, then find a different way, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that that sort of law of, de of detachment became an important element in ultimately getting us to where we wanted uh, to be. And, and ultimately, we wanted to be here, and we wanted to be in, in a position of influence, but we also were under the uh, agreement that if we couldn't, we'll just go do it somewhere else for ourselves. Yeah, so I think this is kind of an important um critical point a lot of people get in their careers yeah is that two things that you hear a lot is you know so there's a disagreement with leadership and values or mission or yes. so forth so either number one they leave and start their own firm or business which you didn't so kind of want to understand why you didn't mm -hmm. um and um Secondly, people believe because of their title, they can't lead. Mm. So, so they'll say, you know, my manager when like, I don't agree with what my manager is doing or what my partner's doing, but I have to do it. Yep. And um, so I would say in both of those cases for you, since you were in those positions, how did you sleep at night staying if yeah. your value system wasn't aligned? No, oh, man. And, and why would you stay instead of just starting your own practice? That's, uh, God, you nailed it. Um, <laughs> it was very difficult. Um, you know, like I said, like, so, so just to give a little bit further context into it, that's exactly our value system was being eroded. Um, mm -hmm. And that's exactly what led us to, I think, being more aggressive around being look, I, I, and I had to do it right. I mean, so we hit that point where it was a challenge, even sleeping at night, knowing that we weren't comfortable anymore with being in a situation where you feel like you're enabling the problem to continue. That's really, mm -hmm. what it, you know, really, it really came down to like looking yourself in the mirror and saying like, I'm enabling this. Right. And, 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 and I'm not okay with that anymore. Um, and you also nailed it with, you don't have to always be in a position of, you know, like there are people, like you said, like there, there are people that have more influence than they think. Um, and where that influence, when you, when we step back and looked at influence and, you know, what we wanted to, like, it was, we were really good at what we were doing. We had customer relationships, mm -hmm. right? So we had, we had, we had, we had value, like we had there were things that we were allowing to occur just because we were allowing them to occur, right? And the reality is from a business point of view, if when we came together and there were, you know, again, a few of us that just said, look, we're gonna, we're gonna stay together in this, you know? Um, and we did this where we said to ourselves, look, here's kind of worst case scenario, right? We needed almost like this, like to, to, to take the risk, I think for some people was important to kind of see, well, what would the outcome be if the risk is taken and it doesn't go as planned? And we, we made a list. We made a list of all the customers we thought we could you know, take. We, we, even if we did it within the partnership agreement, what we'd have to pay for it and can we do that? And we, and we put a plan together. And, and I think that helped, you know, that, that getting together um, and uniting together uh, was really, you know, like that, that moment where you felt, you know, okay, now I know what the worst case scenario is, right? Mm -hmm. So it gives you this internal strength to just push forward 
and and not even caring so much about like what it is you want to accomplish, but just pushing forward, knowing you're doing the right thing. So like finally, for the first time I felt that I was a, like my heart and my and my head were in the fir- in the right place and things just started to happen naturally. Like right. even the way and, 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 and Amy, I, I approached our managing partner at the time right to his to his face and said that he should step down because one of the, I, I couldn't do anything that was going to be Machiavellian or right some coup attempt like I just right. couldn't live with that we could have <laughs> you know mm-hmm. I mean we could have right and, but it again would go against your value system yeah you it would and I, I couldn't do it I just couldn't do it and I kept yeah. saying you know like because there were some that were just like well just let's just do it this way and I was like I just can't I just can't do it right and um you know and and you know look and and I was taken advantage of because I was you know once I had sort of indicated you know and laid all the cards on the table it did, you know, it, it, there were, there, I would say that that was a weakness to, for someone that's going to try to take advantage of that and, and now work behind the scenes. Um, but I was okay with that. Like, I, I knew that. But mm-hmm. I, I, like, it was the first time here where I actually felt that, you know what, I'm totally, this is who I am and I'm comfortable taking whatever, you know, like taking on any partner I needed to. And, um, and like I said, like at that point, it's either it's going to work this way or, or we're going to find another way. Right. Well, and I would say um, a couple of things, like just relating it to um, where firms struggle with innovation, because one of the things, um, you know, that is hard with an accounting firm is people are promoted to an yes. entrepreneurial position, but they're not really entrepreneurs, right? Yes. Because they didn't really start that business. They didn't, um, they've never really taken the risk of putting money on the line and right. like, you know, that sort of thing. And when you go into new services and stuff like that. So exactly what you kind of talked about with this managing partner is really a good exercise for any new service or things yeah. you want to do as far as innovation and say, you know, do we all believe in this and what is the worst that can happen? Where are yeah. our risks and yeah. are we able to stomach that because we believe that this is the right way forward? Right. That's right. Like, which is a really good exercise. And I think the second thing, and, um, and I think this is really hard for people to not play politics because um, it goes back to what they said earlier to yeah. you. If you're too good to people, basically they'll screw you over. Um, So, (laughs) so basically you, you went to them and they tried to, you know, cause you showed your cards, but um, it's, you know, how I would go back to your upbringing that there's certain experiences that you have in life that can help you stomach those hardest times of like, like you saw your dad go through hard times, not lose his value system, be, you know, that was unfortunate set of circumstances of the way the company turned, yep. but it trains you later when you're in these hard positions of like, you know what, I, I gotta yeah. see, see my way through this and That's, do the right thing. <laughs> so it's so, no, it's so true. And it's easy to give up. And, you mm-hmm. know, one, one of the things that I, I learned and, and, and a couple of things, and again, I love, you know, your, your, the name of your podcast about breaking beliefs is, you know, I, I think, it, it comes down to um, this whole concept, I think, of these these accounting firms, where there's there's just a, a belief that things can't be different. It's 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 weird how we've undertaken this as a, as an industry that there's a certain way you do things, and that's the way you do things. And 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 I think when it it uh, when you look at how power is distributed. Mm-hmm. One of the un- one of the things you have to be so careful of um, in a, in a firm and a professional service firm because statistically the professional services firms don't die because of competitive disadvantage Mm-mm. they die because there's internal infighting <laughs> yes <laughs> it's like a rock band yeah exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and we would have been a heavy metal band. <laughs> it's extreme during this period of time. Trust me, 
was I, I, there. It's, it wasn't pretty. I, I make it look good, but it wasn't pretty. Um, but you know, I think it, it's like it's it's uh, it's so one of the things that was real important that I that I learned was that the other thing about influence or, or like what you're onto is that you got to be willing to withstand the pain. Like it's painful to try mm -hmm. to to try to be influential. Um, it's not easy. You have to have you know, and that was the thing, like, w one of the things that I was, when, when I was looking at, like, how am I taking this guy on? Because it really was like taking him on. Right. Um, and doing it in a way that, that it was authentic. And I felt that I was doing it and leading with my heart. And, um, but at the same time, finding this, like, not backing away from it, like, he was going to fight tooth and nail for the power. Right? right. So people that want power will crave power. And what mm -hmm. happens a lot of times, it fatigues others. Right. right. So you find out, you, you just get to a point where you're like, oh my God, it's just, this person's relentless. I, I, okay. And then you start compromising. And, right. that, and that's what was almost happening. Right. Um, and it was like all of a sudden where it was, you know, um, more when he felt there was pressure on it and there were others that felt the pressure too. It was like, well, let's compromise here, you know? And that's where it became real important where I was like, no, there's no compromising, you know? And, um, and, and that's when you have to have belief in yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You just have to believe that because you even, even after like it's all done, you got to be ready to just still fighting. It doesn't end. Right. You know? But you've got to believe that you can you can do this. Like you're, you, and and you just got to be willing to go through the pain. It's not mm -hmm. easy, you know. But I think a lot of us just back away when when someone else wants something more than perhaps we do, and um, you got you, you you can. And I think an organization that's where like for me like the thing as I look at WIS in the future is to always make sure that we're promoting people. And because power is a uh, power is, is, is it's such a obligation to do it right. Mm -hmm. uh, such an obligation. And you got to be very careful who you give power to. Yes, really. It's just it's can be scary. And, you, and, and, you know, it's hard because sometimes you don't realize that, you know, uh, especially if you don't know people and you bring right. people in from the outside and it could be disruptive, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And I love that, that you, you can't back away from the pain. And I think so many people can look at you as a managing partner from the outside and, and be like, you know, how fortunate you are, whatever. They don't know the journey yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> they don't know right. what people go through on the inside because you're still trying to keep a front of client relationships and yeah. a good business running and you're not going to expose to everybody all the hard stuff going on in the background, which is people's personal lives too. You know, yeah. like every day they show up to work and you know, there's stuff going on and you know, you can't wear it. You no, know, Amy, you, it, you're like saying all the things, Amy, you're bringing up all the things that we would want others to know because the, the intangible value of the partnership and the perception of, the togetherness of the partnership uh, matters. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, 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 you absolutely want it to be true and, auth and authentic that those relationships are there. But that was a very scary moment in time for WIS because unfortunately, as this fight was nearing its ending point, the disruption started leading to the outside and to clients. And I remember I was, uh, I got a call on a Sunday night um, from one of uh, my clients and, you know, it was like, what is going on over there? And, it, you know, I was like, wow, it's out there. Um, you know, and, and that's, uh, that was very, very scary because at the end of the day, you know, like even this client was like, look, if you can't guarantee me that you're going to be there, like I got, I got to, I don't want this to be not in my decision, you know, and, and, you know, that's like the, the firm, could unwind pretty quickly. Yes. Very quickly. Yeah. So that was a hard thing to do to, to be able to still march the march and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and I think partnerships are one of the hard, I've been through a number of yeah. them and I've been through something like that. I mean, there's a question here, but one of the problems in a partnership, I find it's not looked at like a corporation. Yeah. 
So the corporate, if you're a corporation, you're looking at what's best for the business. That's when right. you're a partnership, people are individually looking at what's best for them. Correct. Yep. Um, and it's very hard to get partners to look at the company separate from them personally. Yep. So what would be, having gone through this and now coming to the other side of this, what yeah. would be your guidance to partners yeah. um, in any kind of business uh, to make sure that, that you don't end up in this position? Yeah, I, I think there are a few and, and you're, you're absolutely right. I think number one, uh, you, you have to, no matter what, run it just like you would um, a business that you have to think of yourself as an investor in that business and the business needs to be fed mm -hmm. and you have to care for the business. I always look at it as a business is like, it's just a newborn. I mean, right. it, you got to constantly care for it and you got to feed it and you got to, you know, you got to cater to its needs, but you just can't take from it. And um, you know, you're, you, you have to be willing to, again, be very, I would say, demonstrative at times about taking risks and, and, and investing money. And that you, it just has to, like, you almost have to like show it in, in the way that I like to do. It's like, this is the, the kind of pot that's going to innovation and some's gonna work and some's not gonna work. But, you know, the mature business you know, I, I always look at it as like the life cycle. It's like, you know, you have your mature business that has to feed the uh, up and coming businesses. And, mm -hmm. and, if, and if you have a partner group that doesn't buy into that, you know, and I, I think as a partner, you almost have to, like, you know, you got to make a choice at that point in time, because that firm eventually is just going to go away. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it has to. It's just, I mean, again, it's like, it's just basics, right? It's like 101 if you're not going to invest. But so I, I think that's one aspect. And I think, I think a lot of it also comes down to, we've had this conversation, like getting the partnership right, you have to, again, be willing to go to distance. And that does take some complex, complex uh, difficult conversations. And you have to, you have to be very um, strict, in my opinion, on making sure that people live according to the values like the partners have to be held to a standard we're still working at that i mean there mm -hmm. are legacy issues we still work through but we have you know there have been changes in the partnership you know there are people that you know have 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 self-selected out that's not for them and 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 we've had conversation with some that you know hey this isn't going to work um but i think the only way in my opinion to make a partnership like and operate like a corporation is that you have to uh, in, in, insist upon it and also have open dialogue around you're an equity partner and what does that mean you know what right. what, what should an equity partner be doing and 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 also making it harder to be an equity partner i mean mm -hmm. i i think that you know, I look back at decisions that were made and it was like, yeah, okay, so that, that they were good at technical work or they were good at, at, at client development, whatever it would be. But from a values perspective and a culture's perspective, you're really putting a person in a position to lead to toxicity, right? right. So the tangible, like, I don't care how much tangible value they provide, the intangible value that you're losing as a result of this person working against you, it's, it's, it's immeasurable, but very, very um, destructive. And, and that to me, like you have to have people that believe in how to run the business and that they believe in your culture. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we work hard at that. Um, and, and I think that's something that, you know, we will make it harder now for people to become an equity partner. There's Absolutely. A, a difference. And I think there isn't enough um, education on being an equity partner. Is that right for you? Like you can yeah. be a non-equity partner and that might be the right path for you. hundred percent. You know, and I think, you know, when, especially in the accounting firm space and I'm sure in legal, you know, other professional services, there's just not enough education on what like there's this goal to be partner and then yeah. you get into it and you're like, 
ooh, like this isn't what I thought it was going to be and I'm yeah. stuck now. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not true. And, and I don't, again, it's funny you say that because it's always like, it, it, there is, it's like, you know, because and many people say it's like, what, 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 what does it take to be equity? Like, it's yeah. like this mystery, you yeah. know? There's a mystery. And how much do you make as an equity partner? Right. And, Which you, you know, can make uh, less. Yeah. And people don't realize that. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, and, and, and I think, you know, the thing that um, I, I look at, because you're, you're 100% right, uh, that there, you, you have to make, the economics of the business have to work. I, I, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, uh, you know, you learn, you know, the hard way at times that you really, like, and that's what you, and you have to keep that model in place. Like, it, it, you, um, if your business model works, it makes all other decisions a lot easier, you know? And because the other thing you have to be able to do is that, you know, people that let's say that you have a partner that let, they're not equity, but they're, they're part, they're important, you know? Right. And, and that's an important role, but you gotta pay them well. You can't like, oh, you're a non-equity partner and here's your, uh, here's a, your manager's salary plus $5,000. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, so you, you do have to have like, you have to have, you know, I, I think that's where the other thing you talked about with the, the uh, firms running like a corporation there, you do have to have, you mm -hmm. know, some, some, some clear lines of, you know, delineation around compensation and what it means for somebody that is going to get through that point and put the effort in and um, you got to reward accordingly, but you have to have the economics in place to do so. Yeah. Uh, you know? Yeah. We could keep talking. This has been really great. Um, but I'm going to close it up with uh, just some rapid fire questions sure. that I ask everyone at the end of the, All right. the interview. So you pick a category. All right. Family and friends, money, yep. spiritual, or health? Spiritual. Love it. Okay. Yeah. Um, things or actions I don't have that I want. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I still want to make, I, 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 you know, for me, I think it's um, just acting quicker when I know I need to act quicker um, and living in the present, live in the present, like really enjoy the present. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Um, all right. Things or actions I do have that I want to keep basically. Uh, relationships. I love relationships uh, and impact. Uh, you know, I, I absolutely uh, love having impact and influence and mm -hmm. I'm going to miss that one day when I have to give that up. <laughs> well, you'll be like your dad. You may just. Oh well, yeah, exactly. Well, they're, well, they're not going to want to find something else to do. Yeah. Um, things or actions I don't have that I don't want. That's a great question. You know, I think this whole concept of like, I was, I, I really have detached um, from a lot of material type things, you know, and I, 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 th I think I, I want just to keep that way. Like I, I don't, I don't have a lot of burden and I like it that way. So, yeah. Yeah. Freedom. Yeah. Keep it simple. Yeah. yeah. Um, and last one, things are actions that I do have that I don't want spiritually. Yeah. I beat myself up. I mean, you know, I think that's been a quality I've had, uh, you know, since I've been a kid. So um, I could be real, I, 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 I could be my own worst enemy and be very, very difficult on myself. So, you know, I've gotten a little bit easier on, on myself over the years, but I would say like, as long as my intent was good, like, I think I should beat myself up if, if I had uh, not the right intent, but, um, and then guilt taking guilt for things that I really don't have any control over. Right. You know, mm -hmm. uh, especially when I have to make very difficult decisions here, it's again, like sometimes you just have to do it because that's the, the right thing for the whole. Right. Uh, and like, and, and, and just having less guilt about that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and at the end of the day, it's a lonely job. I mean, yeah. even when you have a team, you still are the final one that has to make a decision. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've had to get used to that. Yeah. <laughs> it's not been easy. Yeah. 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 So anything as we wrap up that you want to make sure is a takeaway um, for people listening to this interview. There's been so many great tips from you. Oh, thank you. I think the biggest thing is life is so unpredictable. You know, I think that's, 
you know, it's a gift and, and there's so many good things uh, to enjoy and, and to, you know, really kind of take that in and, and, but at the same time, understand that the bad is part of that and not to get too, too down uh, with, with the bad and almost like expect that there's going to be bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, my biggest thing is just like to live it well. Like, I, I think, you know, I, I'm kind of glad that, that, um, you know, I've had difficulties along the way. They always say like, sometimes suffering is like, you know, it's the, that's the path towards happiness. You right. Know? Um, but, you know, that's the biggest thing is just allow yourself to, you know, go through those bad times and, and to suffer. And, and like we talked about earlier, endure it. Um, because so much is just experience and know, we have, a, we're, we're an incredible adaptive species, you know, mm-hmm. like it, it really is incredible how you, you grow and you don't even know you're growing and, but, but allowing yourself those opportunities to just, there are going to be days it's tough, but yeah. So, but there's well, good on the other side. That longer term vision, you can get through the suffering, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. And you can't lose sight of that, you know? Like yeah. it's easy to. I mean, there are days, there are just, you know, the, the profession, it's a roller coaster, you know? Mm-hmm. It really is. And I think that's something that we're unprepared for coming out and in the expectations um, in public accounting. But, um, you know, that you do, you, you, you do have those, those moments, but you also have those great moments. And, um, you know, I think that there's a lot more excitement uh, than there are the actual downs, but right. I, I don't know, we're not, we're not told that that's going to happen. So right. a little bit of a surprise when it happens, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome. So thank yeah. you so much for oh, thank you. sharing your story. And I think so many people will uh, be able to learn from it as well. Oh, thank you. I'm happy to do it. Thanks for having me, Amy. I appreciate it. And now for the mindful moment segment of this podcast, I have so many notes. I'm not sure where to even begin. Paul gave us so many nuggets of great information and advice from a leadership standpoint. And he was just so authentic with the way he talked about his story and his story really starting with his father being an accountant and losing his job at the time when Paul was young and the importance of going through hard times like that and how it affects you going into adulthood. Now, later in this podcast, he talks about how you have to stick through the pain. And I think for many of us, when we develop those belief systems, we can track back to how that occurred for us, that we have the ability to do that. And sometimes the worst things in our lives create some of our biggest strengths. And when we can look at the positive of those times and how they have benefited us, we can have gratitude for things that are sometimes hard or uncomfortable that have happened in our lives. And I know I've had many as well, but I can also understand where I get my own strengths of withstanding hard times and pushing through it because of those stories that have happened when I was younger. So I can totally relate to what Paul was talking about. And when you go through hard times, especially financially when you're younger, the line that he said was that there's no such thing as an unemployed CPA uh, was such an important line because I think for many of us that have gone through hardships watching parents lose their jobs or businesses or seeing our lives change economically, being a CPA and an accountant definitely ranks up there as job security. Now, the important part is how we align something that we feel is safe with our purpose and our value system. And one of the things he talked about very poignantly is when he started as an accountant, how many with the different roles that he had how he wasn't getting fulfilled in what he had hoped in this profession and i think this is important i talk to college students about this all the time because i went through the same thing starting out uh, when i worked at a big four firm coming out of college and thinking that it would be so much more than your first job and the work that you do But what's so awesome about most professions, when you stick it out, 
you start learning other ways that you can splinter your experience and start aligning it to the things that matter to you the most. And his background, wanting to be an entrepreneur, wanting to run his own business, <clears throat> helped lead him to pivoting his career in accounting to serve what was most purposeful for him. And it's always good to step back and make sure you have your own personal purpose statement. You know, we have mission statements for businesses, but we don't necessarily always put together our own personal purpose statement value system so that we can make sure that what we're doing in our lives is aligned with that purpose. And it's important to write that down. It's important to understand why we do what we do, who do we serve, and is it aligned with what we're most passionate about and who we want to help? So when you've got the opportunity after the beginning of your career to really get the nuts and bolts down of whatever your profession is, that's when you can start figuring out what you want for your future. And when he joined WIS as a staff accountant, his goal was always to be a managing partner, which everybody has different goals. Some might be that they don't want to go past a certain leadership level and others might be to be a partner and others might be to lead a firm like that or to have their own firm. And it's whatever your goals are in, in your career, it's important to make sure that you are intentional about how you get there. And one of the things that he noticed was the divide between the traditional way of running that business versus where it needed to head for the future and was brave enough to figure out how they could communicate and start trying to advise that firm on how to move forward. And this can be a really hard thing because many of us think that we might not have a voice in change or we might not be heard. And it can be really hard because there's definitely going to be people against change because what's comfortable is what they know today. But if we don't give opportunity for people that are comfortable with change to start looking at innovative ideas and so forth and then start structuring for the people that aren't as comfortable in the unknown, the education and the processes and ways that we can get there, then we're always going to have that divide and we can't move forward together. We need to understand that everybody has a different makeup. And if we're fearful of change or if we're someone that's an innovator and likes to be in change, somehow we have to bring that together and nurture those skills in each other and how you make everyone comfortable moving forward. And part of what he did was really understanding what his value system was and making sure that all of the challenges that were facing him, he had a belief system that this was the right thing to do. And the people that were around him also believed that this was the right thing to do. But one thing that I thought was really important that he talked about, and this is really any change you're going through, whether this is personal life or work life, is writing down what is the worst case scenario. So if the worst happened and you weren't able to accomplish what you hoped, then at least know what bad could happen or what would be your exit plan? What would be option B? What would be option C? So that you don't feel fearful of the unknown, that you actually are okay with the risks that you're about to take. And if you are not okay with those risks, then it's important to make sure to evaluate, is this the right path moving forward? And I, he really stressed how important it is to stick through the pain because when you're going through change, there's always going to be people that don't wanna come along with you and it is painful and also very easy to give up because there's some days where you're like, you know what, it's just not worth it. It's not worth going through all of this. And so if we're aligned with our value system and we believe in what we're doing, 
then it's important that we are willing to withstand that pain as we go through it and find ways to influence people where we are authentic. And that was a big point that, that Paul talked about. Um, and thirdly, having a belief in yourself when you're going through it, because sometimes no one believes what you believe. You might see something in the future that no one sees. And so you, in order to withstand hard times, it's important that you believe what you're saying and also you believe in yourself to go through it. And he really gave some important points as leaders that power is an obligation to do it right. That once we have power, a lot of times there's a quote from Gloria Steinem that um, if you have power, that you should speak less and listen more. And if you don't have power, you should speak more and listen less. And the problem is, is as people get up into leadership positions, people are more afraid to give feedback because they're afraid for their own jobs and so forth. And so if you don't create a culture where you can have that upward feedback, then it's very hard to do things in the right way because you're acting in a silo and you're not really clear what's happening at the field level. Also, that he talked about the intangible value of a partnership matters, not just the tangible value of the firm, but the intangible that it's very, that people feel it's an authentic place to be and that people are there for the right reasons. It's not just about power. It's about why do you do what you do? Who do you serve? And how do you do that? So some of his advice was that when you're running a partnership or in a partnership, to run it like an investor in that business, that make sure you take yourself out of it, that this isn't about you, this is about the people that depend on that business and the people that are investing in this business and that you're serving your stakeholders. And that to make sure to care for the business and make sure all of the needs are being met and to take risks and invest money. So a lot of times we get comfortable where we are and we stop spending money because things are just going well. Instead of allocating a certain amount every year for innovation and making sure that you're always looking into the future so that that business is a going concern. Because the thing is, when you're not looking into the future, the problem is that you may get passed by because you're maintaining, but other people are getting innovative and the industry starts changing without you. The other thing that I thought was a really important point was to constantly check in and make sure the other partners hold the same values in the business and that nothing is getting off kilter because if you don't have that open dialogue, it really can hurt the partnership because things can get off track and you don't even realize it. The Another tip that he had was that the value and culture are one, that you can't separate it. And the thing is, a lot of businesses will write down their values and, and so forth, but never refer back to it or make sure that people are adhering to it. One of the tips that I give many times is we do performance evaluations with our the people that work for us. But we don't necessarily during those performance evaluations also evaluate, are you living to the values of the business and making sure that that's still aligned and, and reminding people what those values are and how to live it. And if anything is getting off kilter there, that you're nipping it in the bud fast. So all in all, there was just so much in this interview. I, I really think that uh, it's a really important one to listen to. I'm very glad that this was our 50th episode because I think it was a great example of just the hard parts of leadership and where we have to test our values, test, test our belief systems. And that there's so many good things in the things that we do each day that sometimes we don't celebrate. That we're so looking into the future that we're not in the present. 
And I think what Paul really demonstrated for us all is that even through the difficulties, making sure that we're finding happiness, that we're happy in the present moment, and we're aligning our values with the work that we do so that we're not just fulfilled at work, but we're also fulfilled from a personal standpoint as well. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to the Breaking Beliefs podcast. I hope you will take a moment to pause before entering back into your day to reflect on this podcast and note one to two actions you are inspired to do from today's conversation that you could incorporate into your life. To read the full blog and listen back to this episode or any other, you can find them at www.amyvetter.com forward slash Breaking Beliefs Podcast and related videos on my YouTube channel. For daily inspiration, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Amy Vetter CPA. I hope that you will choose to like this and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and more so that you can join us for more inspiration on our next episode.